She had asked Rob to drive them there. She was not in the mood. She had barely glanced at the car when Rob had started overly apologizing for its condition. It was dirty and there was a slight dent in the back, but she didn't care. Not only was she going through her own thing that was giving her a sense of priority, but Rob had gone through his own thing as well. She told him that there were more important matters going on for both of them, and that had quieted him down. His last comment on the subject was that he would take care of it later. She told him not to worry about it. He could pay for a car wash and just forget the dent. The car still ran and would always be a hunk of junk. On the way there, Sue stared out the rolled-down window space. Her hair was pretty well clipped in place, and she didn't think the wind would mess it up much. She wanted to look good for Michelle. She began to ponder the fact that they were driving to a cemetery that the two of them had already visited together. Hollywood Forever had a Cemetery of the Stars tour that they both couldn't pass up. It was the most tourist-like activity that either of them had done in all their time in Los Angeles. They had always laughed at the people that were driven around in those buses that took you to see Stars' homes. Who the hell cared? Look at that house. Now look at that house. Why was that entertaining? Seeing the grave sites of some great dead celebrities felt like it was worth doing, and was more up their alley anyway. They weren't really into modern celebrities, and one had to be in awe when at the grave where the bodies of such great people were. They visited Mel Blanc, Victor Fleming, Douglas Fairbanks Sr. and Jr., George Harrison, Cecil B. DeMille, Edward G. Robinson, and Dee Dee and Johnny and Joey Ramone's graves. It felt very intimate to get to pay respect to such legends. There was even the grave of Don Adams with a bronze marker of him talking into his shoe from his Get Smart show. The cemetery also showed horror movies that were projected on the wall of a mausoleum every summer. Sue had been the one to suggest that they wait until Night of the Living Dead was shown to go. They kept an eye out for it. The original Dawn of the Dead had played, according to the listing, but they figured if they kept waiting they would get their ideal movie night in the graveyard. They never did get that chance. Sue wondered how Michelle's parents could afford to bury her at such a fancy place. Surely it had to be very selective and it had to be expensive. It was the closest cemetery around. Forest Lawn was the next closest, but that must have been too far out of the way, or too common, or both, for the Hart family. Even if it did seem a little pretentious, it was kind of cool that Michelle would be in company of such amazing people. Michelle was amazing, and should fit right in nicely. They arrived at the entrance in what felt like a very short passage of time to Sue. They passed the sign for the cemetery that had a figure eight turned on its side to symbolize eternity. That was a nice touch. They passed the iron gates that were rolled open on little tires, and then they pulled into the parking lot. There were lots of other cars there. The butterflies in Sue's stomach began flapping their dusty wings in frenzy. It was ten minutes until the service began. "'Can we sit here for a bit?' Sue asked Rob. "'Sure,' he agreed. They sat quietly. "'All right, let's do it,' Sue finally said with less than a minute to go. She didn't want there to be any awkward opportunities for interaction or any chance to be kicked out. They opened their car doors in unison— and made their way to the chapel. It was made of stone and had arched windows. There were vines growing up the side of the building. Palm trees surrounded the place with their ridiculously tall, thin trunks rising to the sky, with just a touch of green fronds on the tops that were moving with the breeze. Inside, the smell was noxious. The perfume of all the flowers was overpowering. Sitting up front, and seemingly unaffected by the sickening aroma, were Veronica and Charles Hart. Sue could just see their backs. They were all in black, it had to be them. They were the only other people in there. All the cars in the lot must be for employees and visitors and tourists, Sue thought. The coffin was on the stage at the front of the chapel. It was heavily wreathed in an assortment of plant life and flowers. Next to it, propped up on an easel, was an enlarged picture of Michelle. It was her high school senior yearbook photo. Michelle looked pretty in it, but she was not smiling. Michelle had always hated that picture, even though Sue had said it was a good one, and nowhere near as bad as hers, where she was in mid-blink. The doors to the reserved section of the chapel were left open, so Sue and Rob quietly entered, without even being noticed. Sue indicated to Rob that they should take their seats in the pew in the back row. There was generic organ music playing from some hidden speakers. Sue looked at her watch. It was two minutes past noon. A man with a comb-over who was wearing a dark gray suit and tie came out from a door at the front of the chapel and approached the stage. He glanced around the room, and then rifled through some papers that were laid out on the podium. There was a microphone attached to it. He pulled the mic close to his mouth and cleared his throat. It was such a loud sound, it made Sue's heart almost skip a beat. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here today to mourn the loss of our beloved Michelle Joanna Hart. 
the man said in his booming voice. Oh no, not my baby, Veronica cried out dramatically. Charles put his arm around her and patted her back to console her. Sue could hear him softly shushing her. The man continued, She was taken from us all too soon, but we can take comfort in the knowledge that she is reunited with the Lord God, and he in his infinite wisdom has a plan for us all. Even if we cannot understand his mysterious ways, let us understand this, that the time comes for us all, some sooner, some later, but we all must eventually return home when our time comes, when our purpose is complete, and it is about how we spent our time on earth when we meet our Creator at heaven's gates. Michelle was a lovely example of a human being. Her life was well spent. She was a loving daughter, and the grief she leaves behind is proof of the impact that she has made here with us. She was a good person, and she will get her just rewards on the other side. Sue began to feel as if maybe she would not be able to go through with it after all. She looked over at Rob. He was just staring straight ahead. She could not read his expression. The funeral was hardly a tearjerker, but they had already shed so many tears before. At least she had. She knew Rob was suffering, too. She knew him too well. Maybe she did not need to add to the stress of the situation. And now, said the man, I would like to read Psalm 116 at the request of the parents' wishes. He nodded at them. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Gracious is the Lord and just. Yes, our God is merciful. The Lord keeps the little ones. I was brought low, and he saved me. I believed, even when I said, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, no man is dependable. Precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O oh Lord, I am your servant. You have loosed my bonds. Sue frowned at a lot of what was said. All those religious sayings were so insulting. Was it insinuating that Michelle was lowly and afflicted and undependable? She wasn't sure. Those religious sayings and their intentions could be so cryptic. She just let that go. The man spoke again. If anyone would like to come up for the viewing, you may do so at this time. Sue piped up and raised her hand to be noticed. Shouldn't some of her loved ones say something about her? Rob looked at her. The man at the podium looked at her. Michelle's parents turned around to see who had spoken. Veronica's eyes went wide when she saw Sue. What are you doing here? she demanded to know as she stood up. Charles began patting her back again to calm her, saying, It's all right, Fern. It didn't seem to be working. There were daggers flying out of the woman's eyes. She was my best friend. May I speak? Sue asked the man running the show. Don't you dare! Veronica yelled to Sue and to the man while turning her head to look at both of them. I'm paying for this and I say no. I can just say it from here then. The man up front looked helpless. Charles grabbed his wife by the arm and yanked her down. Let go of me! Veronica screeched at him as she tried to pull out of his grip. He gritted his teeth and spoke harshly through them. Sit down and shut up. This is not all about you. She was aghast. She inhaled a wounded breath and sat down. She placed the back of one hand to her forehead and breathed heavily, feigning like she might faint. Charles ignored her, as did the few other people in the room. Sue approached the front of the room. She was nearing Michelle's coffin. It was beautiful. It was a cherry wood with intricate grain that made all sorts of interesting patterns that she could see images in, just like cloud watching. It was shiny with the glossy varnish that coated it. The top half of the lid was propped up. As she continued to get closer to it, she began to see the tip of the nose of the body inside. After a few more footsteps, she saw Michelle's face clearly. She was barely recognizable. Her face was coated with thick makeup. Her complexion was cartoonishly tan and her cheeks were not just rosy but red. She looked like she had been painted in primary colors only. Her lips were the same red. Her hair was flat and listless, like someone had just run a wet comb through it and let it dry. Sue was surprised they hadn't emptied a can of hairspray on her head to give her a beehive hairdo to match her face. She was wearing a light gray dress with a white collar. Sue had never seen it before. Seeing Michelle's body wasn't traumatic for her the way she feared it would be. That was because she didn't even feel like she was looking at her. It was like some bad movie prop replication that was made to be shot from a distance for falling off a cliff or blowing up in a car. Sue made it to the wooden podium and grabbed the top of it to steady herself. Her back was turned to Michelle's body, and she looked out at Michelle's parents and Rob. 
The funeral director stood to the side of the stage. This is such a shame, Sue said shakily into the microphone. Her own voice sounded foreign to her coming out of the speakers. Veronica glared at her while Charles nodded at her with agreement and encouragement. All of it. It's a shame that she's gone. And it's a shame you didn't get to know her better. Tears were brimming in her eyes as she spoke, but her voice was growing steadier. How dare you! Look at what you're even wearing, you disgusting whore! Veronica yelled out. Sue continued. Your daughter was the best person I've ever known, and you're sitting there resenting the fact that she loved someone and was loved. Does it hurt you to know that she was so loved? You don't know what love is. What you did with her wasn't love. We loved her. Then why aren't you honoring her? Sue was hoping to get to speak her mind as a tribute to Michelle, but it was turning out to be a semi-public back and forth with her mother. That was fine, though. Standing up to her mother was a tribute to Michelle in its own way. None of this is for her or even about her. You paid for all this but never helped her out when she was alive. This is miserable for her. You're immortalizing her in a way she didn't want to be. She was beautiful and vibrant and loving, and you're trying to take that away from her with all of this... this show. It's a scam. It's a lie. Where was any support from you for her? She was going to be a graphic designer or researcher. Did you know that? Stop this already, will you? Veronica screamed at the director. He advanced upon Sue and lightly touched her arm. Come on, that's enough, he softly said. Don't you fucking touch me. She pulled her arm away. She wanted to be cremated, did you know that? She asked all of them. Her voice was still coming through the microphone loud and clear. You didn't know her. You didn't love her. And despite what awful human beings you are, you too, Charles, for letting it get this bad. She still loved you underneath it all. She was better than you. She was too good for you. All right, you have to stop now, the director said more sternly while nervously waving his hands. Sue looked over at Michelle. They had painted a slight clown-like smile on her face, but underneath all that makeup, Sue thought that she actually looked pleased. I love you, baby. The brimming tears spilled down her cheeks, but her voice remained strong. You filthy, perverted, evil little bitch! Veronica shrieked at her vehemently. Sue looked her right in the eyes and leaned close into the microphone until her lips almost touched it. And nobody can eat pussy like your daughter. Everyone in the room gasped, including Rob. Sue shoved herself off of the podium, and as she did so, it came loose from the floor and tipped over. It fell off the stage and crashed onto the floor below and broke into several pieces. The microphone gave out deafening feedback from where it lay that made everyone grab their ears except for Sue. She stood there looking shocked for a moment before she changed her posture. She then looked satisfied with what had happened. She was. She walked immediately off the stage, down the aisle, and out the door. The microphone continued squealing at its high volume. She walked right past Rob, who had to get up and chase after her. He caught up with her in the parking lot. Feel better now? He asked her as they headed back for the car. Yes, I do, she replied assuredly. a girl.